In this problem we've got an assemblage of two truss elements. We want to figure out the displacement of node 3 and the, uh, the stresses in elements 1 and 2. So we've got two truss elements. Uh, dimensions are shown. We've got a thousand newton force acting to the right on node 3. We know it's steel with a modulus of 200 gigapascal, diameters of 1 millimeter. You know, a couple of things to think about offhand. When we get our results, we do expect member one to be under tension, so I would expect a positive uh, stress on that member. And uh, member two ought to be under compression, so we'll expect a negative stress in that member. So to model this problem, we're going to start out by creating a part. And we're going to be, this is a two-dimensional problem, uh, deformable. In the base feature, we want to have uh, the type of part is a wire. And so our approximate size, it defaults to 200. Uh, the dimensions on the beam, the longest dimension is about 0.1, uh, one of the members. I'm going to go with 0.5. It's a little bit arbitrary, but to get kind of close. So here we've got the setup for our wire uh, type part, two-dimensional. Uh, I'm just going to roughly sketch out what the truss looks like, and now we're going to need to dimension it. Let's dimension this length, recall, was equal to 0.1. Uh, in this case, our units are in meters. We've got to move the point on the right here up. We want to make it parallel to the point on the left, so I'm going to use that uh, to identify it. And then what I'm going to do is create a construction line. I'm going to connect the line between here and here. And the only reason I'm doing that is so I can dimension the angles. So I'll add a dimension here between the construction line and that, and that angle was equal to 30 degrees, and the angle on the right was equal to 50 degrees. So we'll go like that, 50 degrees. Uh, if we want, you can turn off the grid lines if you find them distracting, so I'll turn that off. We can look at our part, and everything looks uh, dimensioned okay, and we're done with our sketch. So here's our part. Eventually what we're going to do is create a mesh. We're going to make these two truss elements. Then we're going to apply boundary conditions and loads to this. So the next part of the module, we're going to have to set the property. We're dealing with steel. I'm just going to name it steel. And then we do need one mechanical property for a truss element. And that's a Young's modulus of 200 gigapascal. So I've set that. Now what we need to do, we've created a uh, material. We're going to go with, we've got two options here, different categories for sections. In this case, the category we're dealing with is a beam element, and the type is under the category of beam, we've got the option of a beam type section in which um, it will require, it will ask you more information than you actually need for a truss element. If we call it a beam section, for example, we have to uh, we'll have to input things like a profile shape. Um, the geometry of the cross-section matters for a beam element. But in this case, we're just dealing with a truss. All we really care about is the cross-sectional area, and there is no bending associated with it. One thing you'll have to be careful about is to get these types correct for what you plan to do later on. So if, for example, you selected a truss, but later on you wanted to do a beam element uh, you didn't give it enough information. You didn't give it the actual geometry of the cross section. So let's, but in this case, we're going to go with the truss. We're going to continue with that. We've got our material. There's only one material of steel. The cross sectional area, uh, they have a diameter of one millimeter. So the area is going to be pi over four times 0 0.001 meters raised to the second power is the cross section of our circle. All right, so we've created a section. Now what we need to do is assign it. We can go to Section Assignment Manager. There's nothing uh, created. We can either create it here, or we can use the button here to assign it. So we're going to assign a section. So here, if you select this, we would assign one section to this element, or to this uh, particular line in the drawing. If I went over here, we could do that. Another way to do this is to hit Shift to click both. Otherwise, I find it's just easiest to draw a rectangle. We're selecting both of these. Both of these elements have the same cross-sectional area, so we're going to just assign them the same section. So I'll click Done. We're going to assign it Section 1 and click OK. Now when we go to Section Manager, it shows that we've assigned it. One thing that I've uh, actually uh, selected here was rendering beam profiles. I'm going to go back, we'll auto fit that, and the way I did that was I went to part display options and I had this selected. If I deselect that, all we're left with our original line. I find it helpful to render the beam profiles just to make sure that I've assigned the sections appropriately. 
If, for example, I had a section over here in which the beam was larger, it would render this side of the truss with a larger or a thicker beam. So it helps me kind of make sure that I'm doing everything right. Some of the other options that we don't need for a truss element, for example, is to create the cross section. If we were dealing with a beam element, we would have to provide this type of geometry, but we don't for a truss element. All we need is the cross sectional area. So now we're going to go to assembly. We're going to insert our part into the assembly. Um, now I've shown it, I've also got what I've done here, assembly display options. I've rendered the beam profile also in the assembly and it helps me see what's going on. So we've created the assembly. In a next part, we're going to go with a step. We're going to create a step. We can either do it here under step manager, create it, or what I usually do is just click here. We're going to go with the default. We're going to deal with a static step on here. and. Within the step is where we actually apply the boundary conditions and loads. In this case, we don't have any interactions. The assembly just com is comprised of one part. The load module is where we're going to set our boundary conditions. So what we saw, boundary conditions here, the displacement, uh, we're going to have, we need to select. So here's one node here. We can select that. Uh, I would need to hold shift down, but I can also select the other node over here. Sometimes I find it's easier to turn off the beam rendering so I can, I can select the nodes a little bit more easily. So I'm going to select here and I'm going to hold the shift key down and select these two nodes. I'm done with that and I want to prevent rotation or I want to prevent translation in the number one and the number two. So the X and the Y direction. There's no rotation no displacement there. And then what I'm going to do is create my load. And I've got a mechanical load. Let's do a concentrated force at the node on the top. So I'm going to select that node. And then I'm going to apply a force. We've got a force of 1,000 newtons acting only to the right or in the number one direction. So now I see my two boundary conditions showing constraints in the X and the Y. And I've got my load going to the right. If I want to, I can go back to assembly, display, render these beam profiles. We could look at it that way. So we've set that up. The next step is a little bit tricky. We need to define uh, a mesh. In this case, we just want two elements. We want an element here and an element over here. Well, the first thing I like to do is set the assign the element type. So now. Uh, one of the things I have to make sure, in my case, I'm making a mesh on the part. So I get that warning. So I'm going to go over Select Part, and I'm going to assign the element types. I'm going to assign both of these the same type of element. And we have to be a little bit careful here. Uh, it's a standard linear, and we're going to go, let's see, a two-node uh, two linear beam in a plane. This has meaning. A B21 gives you, it's a reference to the type of element. You could look in the documentation to see what these different uh, notations mean. We have to be careful here. A beam element allows rotation. We didn't give it enough information. Remember, when we assigned the section, we didn't give it enough information to calculate an area moment of inertia. So this will give you an error if you ran it this way. And for me, it's been a little bit hard to debug occasionally. But you'll have to be careful and use a truss element here, because we've only given it the cross-sectional area when we define this section. So here, what we've got, this notation is a two-node linear two-dimensional truss. So each element has two nodes on either end of it. So we're going to say OK. We want to assign that. So now the next thing that we need to do one thing that you could do is seed the part using a global size. And I find it's easier, at least in these types of situations, to seed the edges. And I'm going to seed both of these, what we might call edges. And the way I'm going to do it, instead of by size, instead of saying I want each one of them to be 0.01 long, I usually go by number. And for each of these, I want only one element on each of the selections. So I'm going to click OK on that. So now I've assigned my seeds. The next thing I need to do is actually mesh the part. So I'll click that. It's OK to mesh it. And now I look down in here. I've got two elements. It does confirm that it's doing what I want it to do. Another thing that's really handy is to go Tools and Query, especially when we get into more complicated parts with the student edition, the academic edition. We are limited to 1,000 nodes. So we'll have to be careful. So I'm going to click Mesh. Uh, I'm going to click 
done on that. And now, indeed, I've got three nodes, two elements. It's telling me two linear line elements of that type. So we're good right now. So I'm going to click, uh, we're going to box out of that. So we've created our mesh, and now we're going to go, we'll skip over optimization. There's nothing particularly complicated going on in this problem. And then we go to job. And one of the things I find handy is to click the job manager button. And within here, I can create the job. Uh, we'll just call it job one and click OK with the defaults. And we've created it, submit it. If it was a more complicated job, you might monitor it. But we've submitted it, and it's already completed successfully. And now click results. And what we see here, there's a few different ways to interpret what we've got got going on. Again, I like to go to View, ODB, Display Options. Let's render the beam profile so we can see what's going on. All right, so here's our undeformed part. If we want to, um, we can look at the deformed part. It, the motion does look congruent with what we might expect. I'm making sure that the two nodes down here haven't moved, which they haven't. If I want to, I can click here and allow multiple plots to show the original and the undeformed state. What we really want to look at now is a stress situation. The, we're looking at the stresses on here. I don't want Mises, uh, von Mises stress, so we've got S for stress, that category. And let's look for the uh, first principal stress, and I'm looking at to make sure with my color scheme I do have red for this member, a positive normal stress, meaning it's under under tension, and I've got blue over here, a negative value showing that it's under compression. Well, so one of the things we want in this problem, uh, well, what we could do, we could probe, click this, and let's figure out what the values actually are. I can probe on the elements, for example. I can click that element, and I've got a stress of 9.9 .9 times 10 to the eighth Pascal. Uh, I can also pro probe on this one, and it shows I've got a negative value, 6.5 times 10 to the eighth Pascal. Uh, so that gives me some values there. Another thing, uh, I don't want to save those probe values. Another thing that we need in this problem is the displacement. So I want to know the displacement of this node, the horizontal and the vertical components. Right now I've got displacement, the magnitude. I want to get the horizontal first off. And note that we're looking at uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 4 for the displacement. So that's uh, half a millimeter, it looks like. Well, let's get the actual value. We're going to go back to probe. We're going to probe the nodes. So I'm going to select this node up here. And in the U1 direction, it has been displaced by about half a millimeter, 0.49 millimeters. So that's the horizontal component. Let's go with, I don't want to save that. Let's go with the vertical component, U2. And we'll probe on that. We'll probe the node here. And I've got a vertical displacement. Looks like it moves upward by about 0.14 millimeters. So cancel out of that. And that gives you the information that you need to know for this problem.